Well, hi there. Welcome to Claremont Lincoln University's Facebook page and our Change Makers broadcast. I'm Dr. Stan Ward uh, here with another one of our great Claremont Lincoln University alumni, where we talk about their capstone projects and their work as change makers in the world, both as students and as alumni. And uh, hopefully, we'll learn a little bit not only about what it means to be a change maker, but tonight we're going to talk about the idea of how to help create an international community at a rural university. So with that, I want to introduce our guest, uh, John Murray. John is a Claremont Lincoln alum, a graduate of our Interfaith Action Program. And after that, I'm just going to say, John, please tell us about yourself. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ward. It's a privilege to be with you. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to share my passion and uh, the energy that came from learning through Claremont Lincoln University. Thank you for your assistance uh, as a guide through my capstone project. Uh, and I'm, I'm just very excited to be a part of this. Uh, I had uh, prior to uh, uh, heading in the direction of Claremont Lincoln University, I was a pastor in uh, Mennonite congregations, uh, first in Indiana and then here in Kansas. And for the last uh, year and a half, I have worked at Heston College, and that has uh, grown out of my capstone project experience with Claremont Lincoln University. Uh, so this uh, was a part of a, a career change for me. So uh, it's been exciting what I've learned, and I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to share. My current role at Heston College is Dean of Global Engagement. Uh, and that's a new role that we've uh, developed at, at Heston College, uh, led by our new president, uh, Joseph Monicum, who was actually an international student at Heston College 30 years ago. Uh, the chair of our board of directors is also a former international student uh, from Japan. And uh, the board and our administration is deeply committed to expanding globalization uh, and our global engagement as a university and uh, the capstone project just really kind of was excellent in preparing me for this role. And did you tell us where Heston is located? Uh, Heston is a small rural community, uh, about 3,500 people. So it's certainly rural. We are in central Kansas, about 35 uh, miles north of Wichita. Uh, so Wichita is the main city that our students fly into. We pick them up there. Uh, we're located right on Interstate 100, 135, uh, just, just north of Wichita. Very good. Yeah, and part of what makes this conversation so fun tonight is uh, we get to reflect on your work both as a, a graduate student and kind of some things you were thinking about wanting to get into when you were in school and then the opportunities that were created as you did this capstone work uh, and, and really kind of took a new career path for you. Right. So with that, I'd, I'd love for us to get into the goal for the, the change project that you took on. Tell us, tell us more about the change you were trying to make. Sure. The change that I was really working at grew out of the, the context of the recognition that we live in an increasingly globalized uh, society and culture. Uh, the world is, is getting smaller uh, in many ways. That's driven partly by uh, technological increases in communications. Uh, when I first traveled to India uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was um, the only communication we had was phone calls and they were two to three dollars a minute. Uh, now I can be in India or, or many other places in the world and uh, live video conference uh, for no extra cost. Um, that reality has brought information, connection, uh, understanding, awareness of what's happening in other parts of the world and, and gives us a lot of opportunity. And uh, tr the technology increase in air travel also. Um, uh, some, uh, an older gentleman who was part of our congregation here in Heston uh, actually grew up in India and he would take him three weeks to travel from India back to the United States when he was growing up. Wow. Uh, now I'm travel over, do work and come back in less time than that. Uh, so the world is changing dramatically. 
And that provides a lot of opportunity for social growth, spiritual growth, economic growth, as we connect in much broader ways uh, with broader markets, broader engagement with a variety of experiences. And yet in spite of that amazing opportunity that globalization provides, we're also seeing in the world the rise of the reality of increasing nationalism, isolationism, separatism, that's really driven by a lot of fear of engagement of this kind of difference. And, and that's really uh, working against uh, really fully utilizing the reality of all the opportunities that this creates. So the goal was to begin to say, what are some of the uh, skills of cultural competency that we can begin to uh, build and offer to one another to maximize the opportunities and, and minimize the risks and the fears uh, that really work against um, and actually create a more a dangerous world to live in than, than a world filled with greater opportunity that, that these advances and changes create. And so in some ways it's a grandiose goal, right? <laughs> and I think uh, part of the challenge with my capstone project from the get-go was uh, you have a grandiose goal and you begin to think in grandiose applications and it's just more than you can do in a, in a capstone project. And so that's one of the places you were particularly helpful to me in, in narrowing, focusing, uh, how, do, how do we get a handle on, on something that we can create in, in a particular area that, that addresses that, but, but in a very focused kind of way? Yeah, yeah. A lot of our students are very idealistic and they have large scale change they want to see in the world, which is great. And we certainly want to encourage that. But there are only so many weeks for the capstone class. And so it becomes a question of what's the next measurable step a person can take. And right. And a lot of that, too, d depends on uh, their context. So for some folks, they create voluntary associations. And again, in your situation, you were able to get connected with a college that provided you with the opportunity uh, to take action. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got connected with Heston to, in order to carry out your project? Yeah, sure. And, and as I said, the grandiose was how do we apply this in business, uh, whether it's to employer employee, or uh, marketing to a broader customer base or healthcare. Uh, education was one of the things on my list, um, both in terms of administration relation to faculty and staff, creating a diverse working environment, but also it's a place where naturally we have uh, a student body uh, in colleges and universities that is naturally diverse. Uh, students choose their college or university for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, everything from proximity to athletic options to uh, music options to uh, and and that reality brings together a very diverse student body and so uh, thinking about how do we work particularly with student body and student leaders uh, several connections that that led me to Heston College in a very natural kind of way. First of all, I'm an alum of Heston College. Uh, I graduated from Heston College um, a long time ago, okay? Um, right out of high school, I went to Heston College and uh, received my associate degree there. Uh, and uh, for the last 17 years, uh, before I started uh, my journey at Claremont Lincoln University, uh, I was pastor at Heston Mennonite Church, which is located on the campus of Heston College. Uh, Heston College is owned by Mennonite Church USA, uh, and it's one of uh, five denominational colleges that Mennonite Church USA operates across the country. And so um, having been alum, being a pastor that's been on campus for uh, 17 years, it was a natural place with place that I already had relationships with people and understood the context that uh, we could begin to say, hey, this is something I'm working on. I want to explore. I want to test some of these ideas. Would you be open to allowing me to test that uh, with your student leaders and see what kind of change we can develop in them so that they can become change makers on the campus? And uh, so it became just a very natural kind of connection 
Um, although at that point in time, the position I'm in was not open and available. And I really didn't, I, I saw this as a way to develop my skill, not a way to get, uh, to get a, another job. <laughs> um, when I made the transition from pastoral ministry, looking for this kind of uh, opportunity for learning and, and change making, uh, I really assumed we'd end up somewhere else in the world and ended up moving across the sidewalk. So, yeah. Yeah, I just put up the banner for the actions you took because I'm, I'm hearing really one of the first things you did is you looked at the, the context you were in, the existing relationships you had, and you were able to find uh, a connection between those existing relationships and the issue you wanted to address. Right, exactly. And and actually, the first action is collaboration with the uh, the dean of students and with the uh, resident directors and to begin to think about... Uh, as we we're preparing this uh, through the summer and the actual project then was at the end of August or the, the beginning of August at the beginning of the school year when our new resident assistants, the college students who are responsible in the dorms when they were coming on board. So it was how, what are the needs, what are the opportunities and how do we begin to, to work at this? Uh, one of the unique realities of Heston College context is even though we are a uh, a small school here in central Kansas. Uh, we have students from 21 countries um, across the world on campus. Uh, our former director of international admissions had been in that role for 35 years. And it's it's really his legacy. Uh, his name's is uh, Dave Osborne. It's really his, his legacy that um, created the opportunity for this kind of uh, global engagement in the midst of a rural college. Um, and so we began to talk about what are what are some of the things we need to address, and and one of them was simply the fact that we talk about domestic students and international students, and the only thing that connects our international students from twenty one different countries is they're not from the United States, mm. uh, and yet we have this kind of assumption that they're kind of a monolithic group. Well, we know they're not monolithic, but but really the only thing that that connects them to each other is that they're not us. <laughs> um, and so how do we begin to engage them differently? And how do we even begin to recognize that our domestic students are from all kinds of cultures and backgrounds and perspectives? And so it creates a, an environment that says, uh, what are the kinds of things that we need to work on? And the three things that we worked on were uh, building awareness uh, of our own filters and lenses that come from our own culture and upbringing and background. Um, I've, one of the things I've said and that I believe deeply is that if you're gonna become culturally competent, the culture that's most important for you to learn and to discover is your own. Yeah. Uh, because if you don't understand your own, you're not gonna understand the lenses through which you're viewing someone else. And you're always gonna misinterpret who they are because you're viewing them through your lenses rather than through theirs. Um, and then the second was to develop a sense of curiosity. Um, and it, it's so easy in our world, especially with the reality of fear, to not be curious about who the other is um, and to how they see the world and, and what shapes their understanding and experience. And then ultimately we have to have some kind of engagement. Because um, if you learn all the theory and practice and skills without actually encountering and, and and creating engagement with one another, uh, that's not going to move us move the needle any anywhere on change either. And that again comes to where Heston College is a unique opportunity, uh, not only because of the um, one in six students in our dorms is from a country other than the United States, and we do our best not we we do our best to pair our international students with a U.S. roommate and to mix our international students across the dorms. In other words, we try not to put all our students from Japan together in the same place. Um, we try and spread them out so that the gifts and the opportunities that they bring to us uh, are maximized across our student body. Yeah, and, and so that's the, the larger context of what you guys are doing at Heston now and, and some of the things that were inspiring that. Tell us about that that 10 week project though that you carried out, especially sure. with lenses, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping maybe there's a, a visual here we can get to here in a minute. Yeah, so so those were the things we wanted to work at and those are really tough. They're, they're really kind of uh, abstract concepts. 
And so how do you begin to create a way to um, make visible that which is not visible? And we, uh, I, I, uh, in collaboration with with many others, um, developed three exercises uh, that used colors, um, in which we began to explore uh, what it means uh, to be aware of our own perception and how we see things and what we see and why we see what we see, and so um, use those exercises as a way to. Uh, begin to open the uh, conversation about awareness, curiosity, and engagement. Uh, the the first exercise that um, that we created was uh, one that I call just simply color awareness. And I'll try and share the screen here. I don't know how this is is going to work real well, uh, but the the picture here uh, has um, a variety of colors on it. And what I did was put this. Uh, slide up on a PowerPoint and only had it up for two seconds. So it was up and gone. And then I invited the students to write down the colors uh, that they saw on the screen. And I was amazed by, by what happened. I mean, my assumption was they would see uh, the red, green, blue, and yellow, and those would be the prominent ones. Uh, there's actually nine colors on the screen right there. Um, and actually red was the one that was kind of middle ground uh, rather than the most pro predominant. Green, yellow, and uh, blue were the most prominently named ones. Hmm. And I would not have predicted that red was the least because it's centrally located. It's the largest. It's, it's one of the brightest. But here's the reason it was in between is about half of the people called it red and half of the people called it orange which in itself is a reflection of perceptions of the way we see things and what we call them. Uh, and so that was a learning I didn't expect out of this. And when I've done this exercise in a wide variety of places since then, that's one of the common realities. My, my first thought was when I did it again, I should fix that. And then I was like, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> um, yeah, there's that's really the great serendipity one. there. It, it, it illustrates right. the point very nicely. Yeah. The, the three colors that are least often seen are um, pink, which is kind of a very uh, faded color down off to the side in the bottom right, uh, and black, which is highlighting. It's, it's a border of three different circles. The green, gray, and blue all have the black border around them. And then the other one is white, which happens to be the largest color, the most predominant color on there. But we don't notice it. We're not aware of it because we see that as what sets everything off again. We, we compare all the other colors to that. Yeah, I'm going to that question. Do fish know they're swimming in water, right? I mean, it's, right, it's, exactly. It's the background, you take it for granted. Right. And that's where the reality of privilege begins to be talked about, because especially as as a white male myself, I tend not to have to define myself um, and to define what it means to live in this culture of being white male, American, middle class, educated. Um, that's the assumed culture that everything else gets compared against. And one of the important things for me then is to be able to learn to define myself and the culture that that shapes my lenses uh, and the way through which I view the world. Um, so yeah, so showed this for two seconds, wrote it down, listed everything that people saw, and then I put it back up and said, so yeah, why did we why did we do the things we did? Uh, and this was not me telling them that, what I just told all of you, uh, it was them answering the questions. And you build awareness and people get it. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of teaching with this. You just open the awareness. And the conversation just is kind of the aha kind of conversation that's, a, that's really fun to be about. Um, the uh, uh, second uh, exercise that we did is one that uh, I called Count the Red Cars. Um, and that was the title of the exercise. And what I developed there was a series of 30 pictures of different kinds of cars 
that were a wide variety of colors. Um, and there was red, blue, green, white, yellow. Um, and I told them the title of this exercise was count the red cars. And at the end of the exercise, I was gonna ask them how many red cars there were. They go through at starting at about one slide every second and a half and goes to about one slide every half a second. So mm -hmm. they're flying through. Uh, these are not, I mean, these pictures are moving through. And you get to the end of that exercise and I ask how many red cars were there? And you get this loud response from the group that says eight. And it's it's in unison, it's all together as if, yes, I got it. Nobody else did, everybody did. And then I ask what, how many white cars there were? And there's silence in the room. Hmm. Now, how many green cars were there? And there's silence in the room. And, and I did this last week at a, a national church convention in Kansas City. And a group of high school students, I said, how many white cars there were? And one of the responses was, that's a trick question. There weren't any white cars. Actually, there were three white cars up there. <laughs> um, but it illustrates the reality that what I did there by the title of the exercise and telling them what question I was going to ask, I created a social norm. And I established that social norm just by the language that I used. And they bought into the social norm. Anything outside the social norm doesn't count. And that becomes also a part of an awareness of the lenses that we have. And so when someone's from another culture, they come saying, you know, I really need to count the green cars. Um, and then you say, well, no, there weren't that many cars. Or I, it, and it's just a sense of confusion. And again, it's an exercise that creates awareness of our perceptions and the social norms we create. Now, it's obvious that red cars were the social norm in that exercise. The challenge is to understand what the social norms are that shape the lenses through which I see the world that limit my understanding of someone else who sees the world through another set of lenses. Um, and then the third exercise uh, was, from my experience, the most fun. Uh, and it, it actually had a couple of parts to it. And the first one was that I had everybody um, put on uh, colored glasses. Um, and so we had uh, my sister and I who helped me develop some of this. Uh, we made um, 30 sets of colored glasses that were red, blue, yellow, and green lenses in them. And we put the, had everybody put those colored glasses on in groups of four. So each group of four had one of each set of lenses. And then the first exercise in that was to uh, put up a picture uh, such as um, this one here. And let me switch pictures for you. Um, a picture such as this one and uh, the first question that I asked was, uh, what do you see? And if you're wearing red glasses, what do you see? Well, if you're wearing blue glasses, what do you see? If you're wearing um, yellow glasses, so forth. And then we did that with a couple different slides similar to this one, and they're all seeing something different up there because they have different filters on. And then at the end, I asked, well, who's right? Um, and there are two two responses to that question. One is everybody's right because the question is what do you see? And I'm assuming that there are no liars in the group who are telling me see something they actually don't. Um, and the second reality is nobody's right is because nobody's seeing what's actually on the screen. They're only seeing a little bit of it. Uh, and then we did the second exercise which I put up pictures like this and I said, now work in groups of four, each with your different cl colored glasses. And I want you to figure out what's actually on the screen in a group of four and decide what that is. And what's amazing to me as many times as I have done this in a variety of settings beyond the capstone project, people figure it out right. and they're right. Not only about all the shapes that are up there, but they can figure out what colors are up there even if they can't see it, and you ask for a group response and they will nail it, what's what's on there. 
Um, and then we get to the end and I say, well, let's reflect now on what happened in your group. What made it possible for you as a group to actually figure out what's up there? Um, and then we start talking about the reality of the dialogue that has to happen, that everybody's perspective is important. If there's somebody who doesn't say anything, they're not gonna figure it out. Um, uh, one of the uh, astute comments from one of those last conversations was, you know, it's really the place where we all need to step forward and then step back. Um, we need to step forward and say, this is what I see, my perspective is important, but then we need to stay back and say, what's your important? What, what's your perspective? What are you understanding? And uh, there has to be a sense of trust among the group that I can't see that, but you say it's there. <laughs> um, and, and, I mean, that's, that's the self-awareness, right? Once you, when you know you've got these colored lenses, exactly, you're, you're going to be maybe more open to hearing other perspectives than exactly. if you think you've got clear lenses. And Exactly. And when we come with the assumption that we can see things exactly as it is, we're not going to um, we're not going to be able to understand that, and that's the advantage of doing something overt like putting on filtered glasses. Is we all come with the assumption that I can't see the whole thing. The same thing is true in reality. Um, I can't. I I need. I'm dependent upon people from other cultures, other religions, other ways of seeing things to help me see things that I can't see. Um, what well, I was going to say, I, I feel like that—that that also it brings us to this issue of results. Uh, you know, the, the insights that folks are having from the experience. So I'd be curious. Tell us more about the results that you saw with working with that student group, as sure. well as some of the larger results that you're seeing now in your larger role there at Heston College. Right. Uh, let me add one more piece to the last before I jump into this, and that's that the last part of the conversation is that to, to just simply point out that I did not teach them how to have the conversation. I, I didn't give them, if you're gonna figure this out, here's step one, two, three, four, five. I just said, figure it out. Mm -hmm. They all knew how to do this. <laughs> um, they all knew how to do this, just from the reality of that understanding and awareness. And, and that, that's where it went. The, the results, um, the way we tested this, uh, is we, I, I worked with, um, collaborated with a friend of mine who has his, his PhD in uh, statistics and questionnaires and how do, you, how do you develop these things. He helped me develop some questions around uh, awareness, perception of other cultures, other people, our comfort with those conversations. And so we did a pretest with the student leaders uh, just to see where they were at. And then after we went through these exercises, we did a post-test um, right on the same day. And it was dramatic, the change uh, of, from before and after, um, especially in the areas of valuing the perceptions of those who are different uh, than we are. Uh, three weeks later, I met with the same group of RAs. They had been actually in practice now. Students were in the dorms. Uh, they'd been doing this stuff for several weeks. And we went through and did a kind of a follow-up and did a, a three-week-later post-test. And what I found there was there's actually some slippage back to the previous perceptions. And so then we talked a little bit about what that meant. And uh, one of the things for me that it really illustrates about change is change is never a one-off experience. Uh, change is something we have to work at and keep working at and keep engaging because it's so often, it's so easy to fall back into the routine of the way we assume things, uh, things always are or always were. Um, and so it's, it's really important in being a change maker not to assume, oh, I'm going to create this great seminar and a few exercises and we're going to change the world. That's not the way the world works. Um, and so to continue to work at this, um, what's been exciting to me is being a part of, of Heston College now for two years as an employee, uh, nearly two years, is to see 
the reality of, of continual change that's continuing to shift into the campus culture and climate. Um, we actually now have more international students who are RAs, leaders in our dorms, uh, who are leaders on our athletic and uh, other extracurricular realities. Um, and it's like they're finding their voice. Right. And it's not simply because somebody said, yeah, we should listen to them more, but because the dominant culture, which even though we have a significant number of international students, um, we, it's, it's the domestic students, those of us who are the dominant culture are becoming more trusting and aware. Now, we also have to keep working at that all the time. We can't just kind of say, oh, we got it figured out now um, because we don't. And it's also revealing more things that we need to work on. Uh, one of the trainings that I went through is called Roots of Justice, which is an anti-racism training. And one of the things that really took me aback as I went through that six months ago was the awareness that multiculturalism often masks racism. Um, and so because we begin to think we're doing well with cross-cultural, we may actually be overlooking the dynamic of, of racial integration and that happens when people of different races and cultures grew up within the same context. Um, and that's a different dynamic than when you're engaging multiculturally from different uh, nationalities. We've got a long ways to go. We need to keep developing more awareness and uh, more curiosity and uh, continue to develop greater engagement as we go. So, um, yeah, I don't want to communicate that we've got this thing figured out. Um, what I want to communicate is we at Heston College, I myself am committed to continuing to be change makers as we develop even more awareness of ways and things that need to be changed uh, in the world in which we live. It does sound like there are two things that you've noticed, though. One is certainly an increased awareness uh, in those who participate in the activities. There's that instant awareness of the, the value perspectives. And then it's going to be transferring itself, I'm hearing, and you're seeing more and more engagement with your international community or your international community becoming more and more engaged on the campus. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, and what's been fun for me about being a part of and, and giving leadership and developing these things is to see how, as I've done this in different parts, uh, people have embraced this and are starting to take it in other places. And I've been invited to take it to other places much broader than Heston College and uh, to begin to see how these uh, realities are playing out in other ways. Uh, in fact, a couple of the slides I shared with you tonight are slides that other people have developed who use this kind of stuff after I did and then have said, hey, I started doing this. Um, at the recent convention in Kansas City, uh, one of the observers of what was going on came up to me afterwards and said that they were a professor in another university in another state, and they were playing with some other ways in which uh, perception and bias play in and how they might do that through the arts. And uh, so it's just been uh, been really fun to see um, how these kind of conversations, just as awareness grows, it kind of, people begin to see, oh, we could try this out of my discipline and out of my experience. And it's, it's really not just about colors and shapes and colored glasses and filters. Uh, it's about all kinds of ways that we can get at um, the reality of different biases, perceptions that can generate fear or can generate opportunity. Um, and seeing those aha moments uh, are fun. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I, as you're talking about fun, I started. I clicked on our banner to change over to what you know, what you're enjoy, what you've enjoyed most. Uh, you, you kind of got me hearing and thinking about Gene McNiff uh, has a textbook on writing and doing action research that we're currently using with our capstone class, and she talks about how these projects, uh, when we do them well, they should give us joy. Yeah. And so uh, certainly, your your uh, persona radiates that as you talk about these things. You've been smiling. 
but I'd be curious to hear it maybe in more detail. What are some of the things that you've enjoyed most in being intentional in that change maker space? Yeah. Actually, to be honest, what I've enjoyed the most is the kind of connections and relationships I've been developed with other people, which ultimately has created change in me. Um, and to continue to enjoy the reality that being a change maker is not about changing people to think like I do or to understand, but it also, it, it opens me to learn a lot more things and to discover more things. And it's been such a privilege and a joy to be in a role now that, that allows me to uh, engage with people in other places. I have the opportunity to do international travel, to uh, recruit students and to begin to develop global partnerships uh, for some new things that we're developing at the college in terms of global engagement. And it's so transformational for me to be able to continue to see these. Uh, um, one of the really fulfilling experiences I had was one of the first students who um, came to Heston College after I was um, in the role of uh, leading the international admissions process, uh, came to us, he was weak in English, was, I mean, studying in another language at a college. He was with us through the, the two-year journey. And when he graduated, um, he came to me at, gradu at, at the end of his time at Heston College. And he said, I, I just have to tell you, John, I, I got the highest grade in the class in A&P, which is one of our toughest classes on campus. <laughs> and so here's a student who came and, and he came as, as shy and reserved and how am I gonna connect here? And to go into the cafeteria and seeing him sit at a group with um, uh, students from various parts of the world, various parts of the US, and having them all laughing together. Um, there's so much fulfillment for me in that. Um, the work that we're doing is incredibly more and more challenging in the world in which we live. And the political realities in which we live and the increasing nationalism and isolationism that, that we see in countries around the world, but it's also so much more important. And when we begin to see these kinds of changes take place, um, it's it's incredibly fulfilling for me and, and just brings me a level of joy that um, that's it's hard to put into words. I'm yeah. glad you can see it in my face because it is a reality. Is it challenging? Oh, absolutely. Are there days it's discouraging? Uh, certainly. Um, but when those things, when, when those things begin to be visible, um, it's it's so much fun to be a change maker. <laughs> yeah, and so what have you learned about being a change maker? Um, first of all, it's it's hard work. Um, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, there are all kinds of challenges, and um, yeah, it's it's important work to do, but it's not easy. Um, secondly, I've learned that as a change maker you have to be willing to be changed yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be open to discover new things all the time. And that's part of why I have fun doing these seminars. I keep learning new things from, from the people that I'm engaging in this. And, uh, and it's important as a change maker to open yourself to be changed in the process and uh, to, to value that. Um, yeah, I, I've learned that we can't always predict the outcome and it's often better than what we thought it mm -hmm. might be. <laughs> um, yeah, there's and, a lot of serendipity I see in, just across yeah. the board in the student projects. There are a lot of unexpected results that end up being yeah. really good things, uh, not anticipated, not planned, uh, not even initially desired at first, but these yeah. neat surprises. Right, and and those are, are so much fun to see. Um, but to be able to go into this change not uh, with the values in place, and that's one of the things I appreciate about Claremont Lincoln University is is its value-based education. And, and it's about 
learning those values and then applying them. So it's not so much getting everybody to think this or agree with that or discover that, but to open ourselves to those values of, of mindfulness, dialogue, collaboration, change. Um, and if you've been a part of Claremont Lincoln or ever will, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say those four words there. Yeah, we won't tell anybody that you paused there on the second one. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, that was good. I'm impressed. Yeah. Yeah, we so, you for that. That was good. You got all four core core values. Got them all there, and yep. yeah, and well, and that's the important thing. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say, and so advice for others who want to be change makers. What again? We're, we're recording this, uh, hoping sure. that, that students in the future will watch this and, and take some inspiration from it, as well as others who are just interested in the work that Claremont Lincoln does. So, for those who want to be change makers, what's what's your advice? Uh, first of all, embrace the idealism and the big picture of change that you want to see. Uh, don't don't lose sight of that big picture idealism that we want to go to. Um, but don't get stuck there either, because if you get stuck there, you're you're not going to create the change because you're going to get overwhelmed and depressed and discouraged. <laughs> um, but also don't lose sight of that, because if we lose sight of that, we also lose part of the motivation for change um, and the understanding of the need for change. Uh, secondly, keep keeping the big picture that that idealistic vision in mind. Um, look for the local context and where can where are where am I uniquely positioned in the thread of my life um, to be able to make those engagements and to discover things. Uh, secondly, or thirdly, I don't, I don't know. I'm losing track of my numbers yeah. here. Um, yeah. Um, read like crazy. Uh, engage those who are different than you are. Um, part of what brought me to the place I am and the threads I am in life are were the very fact that I was encountering and engaging people from other cultures and other religions I hadn't planned on from my life journey when I was looking back uh, as a young pastor, I did not have the vision that my life was going to, I was going to be a local pastor in Mennonite church. Um, but fortunately for me, uh, I engaged uh, some folks from India who moved into our community and they changed my life. And I'm so grateful. Uh, because they opened me to a world and perceptions and awareness that I wouldn't have found any other way. And they took me back to their home community in India and introduced me to their friends and their family and their neighbors who were Hindus and Muslims and Christians um, and working together to create a difference in the world. Uh, and then I had another unique opportunity to uh, engage uh, interfaith through um, the Council on Foreign Relations and their interfaith uh, and their uh, religion and foreign policy initiative. And such a dynamic engagement of uh, people from all manners of faith across the United States. And to begin to, to reflect together on that, those experiences changed me and help me to see the value of opening ourselves beyond. So to be a change maker is to open yourself to be changed and and then invite others to experience that same reality. And I think that's where the opportunities, be they social, spiritual, economic, that's what the opportunities are that are given to us by this incredible technology transformation that we're frankly having difficulty keeping up with. Yeah, but <laughs> um, it, that really is a nice, nice summary point. And I think it ties together well, a lot of the skills we're trying to teach at Claremont Lincoln. When you say, okay, if you really want to be a change maker, one, you've got to be open to change your, to experience change yourself. because It's not right. unilateral. And then two, invite others on the journey with you. Yeah. That's a, exactly. a great summary of it. Well, yeah. is there anything else you want to share uh, with, those watching on Facebook or students at Claremont Lincoln tonight? Um, just the encouragement to be change makers, to open yourself to be changed and transformed and to, to step forward as leaders of change, 
and to be willing to step back and, and see what change is developing um, and do that through, I'm in education, I believe in education. Uh, part of the Claremont Lincoln University experience was part of the transformation for myself. Um, embrace those opportunities when you have them uh, to continue to open yourself to new uh, opportunities and skills. So um, whether that's at Heston College at the associate and bachelor degree level or at Claremont Lincoln University at the master's level, um, uh, cultivate those values of opening yourself to others. So thanks for the opportunity, Dr. Ward. It's It's been a joy to revisit this again and have a conversation and uh, renews my own inspiration. Um, good. All the stories. So, well, John, it's always good to reconnect with you. Um, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, for those who are watching this, thank you for your time as well. And we hope you've got a few uh, gold nuggets of ideas of what it means to be a change maker and how you can apply that in your context. Bye bye, everyone. All right. Goodbye.